Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Science in the Age of COVID-19. Today we are extremely honored to have a, uh, a real titan in the field of coronaviruses with us today. We have Susan Weiss, who is a professor of microbiology at UPenn. Uh, Susan know, knows a thing or two about coronaviruses. Her first paper on them was in 1981, where she did a comparison of the sequences of human and rodent coronaviruses. She uh, appears to have done many of the firsts in the field, or at least um, contributed to. In 1985, she showed that uh, coronaviruses could infect the brain, particularly the substantia nigra, and she worked out the details of that, showing that it was mostly glia, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. Um, following shortly on the heels of that, she was one of the first to show that coronaviruses uh, can be involved in the etiology of the demyelinating disease multiple sclerosis. In 1988, she seems to have been the first to clone um, one of the non-structural proteins, the NSPs, followed quickly by cloning the um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of uh, murine hepatitis virus. And she seems to have gone down a lot of other rabbit holes in the meantime, like working out some basic biochemistry of the major, major histocompatibility complex in the brain. So Susan will give um, a, um, a glorious talk, I am certain, and take us um, back to show us um, a lot of things that were figured out a long time ago and things that she's currently figuring out now. So Susan, take it away. Okay. Um, I did unmute myself. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. I don't think I've ever been called a Titan before. <laughs> and some of the stuff you talked about seems like ancient history to me. But um, so I'm going to talk about a, a kind of a two part talk. The first part will be history and biology. And I think it's really um, important to understand the coronavirus life cycle because in doing so, it helps us uh, identify steps in, at which we can direct antivirals that might be effective against many, if not all, coronaviruses. The second part of my talk is going to be on uh, the incredible ability of coronaviruses to antagonize the innate immune response. And I think that's important because it seems like during infection, both in, in mice and in humans, uh, MERS and SARS really don't induce very much interferon during early infection, but that during later infection, interferon and other cytokines become part of the pathology. So I will start off by showing um, uh, pictures of nidoviruses. So coronaviruses are a subset of nidoviruses. Uh, the nidoviruses are named for the nested subgenomic RNAs generated during infection, and I'll talk about that a lot more in a, in a minute. Uh, they're envelope viruses, and they have single-stranded positive sense RNA genomes. And here's a picture now kind of pretty well known of coronaviruses in the electron microscope. And you can see these projections, um, which is the spike protein forming what, um, what's referred to as a, a crown-like or corona-like morphology, and hence their name. So this is a coronavirus virus particle, which you may have seen before, but I just want to point out a few things. So here's the, um, the RNA is a long 30 kilobase uh, single-stranded RNA. It's capped and polyadenylated as a positive strand RNA. Um, it's complex with this basic nucleocapsid protein and in a helical conformation inside of the virus particle, surrounded, which is surrounded by a membrane, which is derived from the host cell, which I'll talk about again as well. And there are three glycopro three proteins in the cell membrane. The spike protein that everyone I think knows about that's responsible for entry. Uh, it binds to the receptor and mediates uh, cell to virus cell fusion. Um, it's an important determinant of tropism, immune response, and virulence. Um, two other proteins that are also important in the membrane are the M or membrane protein and the E or small membrane protein. Both of these are important in assembly of, of virus particles and also have intracellular functions. Uh, some coronaviruses also encode a hemagglutinin esterase 
um, which is uh, similar to flu HA. Uh, it's encoded by the mouse coronavirus, but uh, not by uh, SARS or MERS. Uh, this is the history, a little bit of a history lesson. I want to talk about coronaviruses since uh, I started working with them about 1980. Um, but there's evidence or there's literature of some of the coronaviruses back into the 60s and 70s. So I would say since then, um, people have been studying mouse hepatitis virus model, studying um, animal coronaviruses. There are many infections, many coronaviruses that infect animals and they're important. And vaccines, there's been a lot of vaccine work for the uh, IBV chicken virus, the bovine coronavirus, porcine viruses, bovine viruses, um, a cat and dog viruses. And people have been studying the human cold viruses, which um, were pretty obscure until recently, but I think now everybody's heard of OC43 and 229E that cause the common cold, but OC43 can also occasionally infect the lower respiratory tract. And between that time and 2002, when uh, SARS emerged in, in Southern China, as I said, people did a lot of work on these on these viruses, and we found out a lot of fundamental things, like how the the um, a very interesting non-continuous transcription system, which I'll talk about in a minute, about uh, the receptor, about the spike protein being cleaved by furin. All of these basic things were discovered um, with the mouse virus. Uh, in addition, the IBV chicken virus and the bovine virus, mostly. Um, so after SARS emerged, people got really much more interested in coronaviruses and a sort of beginning of the pathogenic human coronavirus era, so to speak, um, and looked for other, other coronaviruses. And these two, HKU1 and NL63, were identified um, both in humans uh, causing pneumonia and bronchiolitis. So they're kind of more pathogenic than the original cold viruses, but not lethal like SARS. COVID. The other thing that was discovered around this time was that uh, coronaviruses could be found in bats, that there were many, many coronavirus species of viruses in, in bat hosts. Um, and, I'll, and, um, and so, as I think we all know by now, the, this original uh, epidemic only lasted about eight months, and then SARS was really, um, was ended by really isolating patients and taking care of them. It didn't, it didn't spread uh, without symptoms, so it was much more easily tracked. So then things were pretty quiet in coronavirus world until 2012 when MERS coronavirus emerged in the Middle East. Um, and uh, MERS, MERS is still causing infections at a, at a slow rate. Um, uh, it's not nearly as contagious as the two SARS viruses, but it does uh, continue to, to infect people. And then things were again pretty quiet until 2019 when we all know that SARS-CoV-2 emerged in Wuhan, China, different part of China from SARS-1. Um, so now SARS-CoV-2, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2 all cause severe respiratory disease. Um, and just to be really precise, coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 is the name of the syndrome or the disease cause, whereas SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. I think it's kind of like HIV and AIDS um, in terms of the nomenclature. So just want to point out one other thing about history. So the first international coronavirus meeting was held in Würzburg, Germany in 1980. I was at that meeting. Uh, there were 60 people there, was, was probably most of the field. In 2003, we had the 10th international coronavirus meeting in the Netherlands, uh, just after SARS emerged and it attracted hundreds of people. And we were supposed to have the 15th meeting, international meeting now called NIDOVIRUS meeting in the Netherlands uh, in May of 2020, and it was postponed because of the virus. Uh, these meetings, it's kind of ironic to me, they were gonna be in the same um, resort in the Netherlands, uh, one associated with SARS-1 and one with SARS-2. So, okay, so uh, these are the coronavirus genome structures. You may have seen this before, and I'm just gonna point out that human viruses are found among the alpha coronaviruses and the beta coronaviruses, of which there are three lineages, uh, A, B, and C. Um, and uh, so 2290 and NL63 are alpha viruses, OC43, HKU1, and MHV, the mouse virus, are lineage A viruses, SARS is a lineage B virus, and MERS is a lineage C virus. All coronaviruses have this very long replicase gene encoding six non-structural proteins, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, and the thing that, and that distinguishes these different groups is the accessory proteins encoded at the three prime end of the genome among the structural proteins that are all in the same order, spike E, M, and N. But these accessory proteins with the numbered ORFs um, are different for each lineage. And I think, I think of them as giving each lineage a kind of character. They, they're often 
uh, genes that, uh, proteins that are um, directed against the host response. And I'll talk about them in a lot more detail in the second half of the talk. Um, it became clear pretty soon after SARS-2 was identified that it was in this beta coronavirus group, uh, lineage B. It has a very similar genome structure, uh, including these um, accessory proteins with some differences to SARS-1, also a very similar uh, sequence. So it's clearly in this category. Um, just a real quick uh, summary of the ripe life cycle. Uh, and this is a very simplified version that I did in 2005 after SARS-1. So this um, virus particle attaches to its receptor via the spike protein. It's internalized into the cell. The nucleocapsid or the RNA is translated into a replicase shown here. And the replicase then uh, replicates viral RNA, genome RNA, and synthesizes these subgenomic mRNAs. This is actually for the murine virus, but it's very similar for all the coronaviruses. So then uh, this, the membrane proteins are inserted in intracytoplasmic membranes here, E, M, and S. Um, the nucleocapsid protein complexes with new genomes that actually, and these capsids bud into the um, intracellular membranes at the ERGIC, the ER uh, Golgi Intermediate comp Complex, um, and can be seen in vesicles where they're transported to the membrane and, ex and uh, released from the cell. And the spike protein is also deposited on the plasma membrane where it can um, mediate cell-to-cell -cell fusion, which I'll show later. Um, I'm going to just talk about three steps, um, conserved steps in, in replication, entry, uh, genome or RNA synthesis, and translation of these conserved replicase proteins, because I think these are really common things to all coronaviruses, and they're interesting in themselves. So coronaviruses, this may be known by, to everyone too, but I think I have a few wrinkles on it. Coronaviruses use two routes of entry into the cell. The first route is a direct plasma membrane route shown here. So the virus particle attaches or recognizes um, the ACE2 receptor in the case of SARS-2, angiotensin converting enzyme. Upon attachment, um, the, uh, the spike protein is then cleaved by uh, a, a, a protease on the cell surface. In the case of these respiratory, the alveolar cells, um, timpers too. And um, once the spike protein is cleaved, cleaved, it can then activate or it can then mediate fusion between the cell and viral membranes and injection of the nucleocapsid into the cell. The other route is an endosomal route whereby the spike again attaches to ACE2 and the virus particle is endocytosed into the endosome. And in the low pH environment of the endosome, it's, the spike is cleaved by cathepsin, another protease, and again, there's a fusion between cell and viral uh, membranes and the nucleocapsid is released into the cytoplasm. So the interesting question is which, um, which, what determines which route is used by a particular virus? And that depends on the proteases uh, present on, on the um, infected cell. So uh, TIMPRS2 is, is, can be present on the plasma membrane. There can be other uh, proteases important as well. Um, and then there's uh, furin. Furin is an intracellular uh, protease that cleaves the virus, that cleaves the spike protein in the producer cell. So viruses that have a, a furin cleavage site in their spike um, only need, they, they also need a second cleavage to be, um, to, to be activated. But let me show you that, give you an illustration. So this is all, this is several strains of MHV. So all spike proteins have to be cleaved there, there are two subunits of spikes, S1 and S2. S1 has the receptor interacting domain, and S2 um, contains the fusion machinery. So it has to be, spike has to be cleaved at the S1, S2 boundary and at, the, and at this S2 prime site as well. Which, um, so this releases the two subunits, and this um, exposes a, a furin, a peptide that allows or promotes um, fusion. So, this strain, for example, JHM, has a really good furin site, which would be a very uh, basic run of amino acids. And this protein is completely cleaved during uh, assembly of the virus. So this JHM comes out of the cell already cleaved at S1, S2, and it, cleaves, it gets cleaved by uh, the cellular uh, plasma membrane associated protease, in this case, tempers, um, and, and enters the cell entirely by this route. Um, this, the uh, MHV2 is completely uncleaved. It has a, a mutated furin site. Um, it comes out uncleaved and it enters the cell completely by the endosomal route where uh, both cleavages can occur uh, by cathepsin in the endosome. And then we have a third strain, A59. It has a partially cleaved, a less basic furin site. And that strain enters the cell by both, um, both routes. 
So, and all of, the, and I should mention, all of these viruses are, are perfectly pathogenic. So a cleavage site doesn't necessarily tell you uh, how pathogenic a virus is gonna be. So why do we care about all of this? Because when thinking about inhibitors, um, uh, an inhibitor that uh, a virus that enters by the endosomal route may be inhibited by chloroquine or cathepsin inhibitor or something that um, targets this route of, of, of infection, whereas a virus that enters by the plasma membrane route would have to be um, inhibited by something like a protease inhibitor like hemostat that inhibits tempers too. But as I said before, some viruses use both routes, so you would really have to target both routes to completely uh, shut down infection. And this is also somewhat dependent on cell type. So just because um, tempers is, seems to be the main protease in the uh, alveolar type 2 cells, it may not be in all the other cell types that, that are infected by SARS-2. Okay, I want to talk now a little bit about transcription of coronavirus mRNAs. Uh, this occurs... Um, so here's the genome RNA. It's got a leader sequence of about 100 or so nucleotides. It's got a five prime capped end and a three prime polydenylated end. And these uh, TRSs are transcriptional regulatory sequences that are present at the beginning of each open reading frame or each mRNA. So during um, infection, the, the genome is translated into an RDRP, an RNA dependent RNA polymerase, uh, that then transcribes the plus strand into a negative sense, anti-sense genome, which is then copied back into a lot more genome RNA that's replication. At the same time, the genome is transcribed into a, a group of subgenomic negative stranded RNA shown here. And this is done by this really interesting process whereby the, the polymerase uh, starts to transcribe and it reads, reads one of these TRSs and then the polymerase and its nascent chain presumably jumps to the five prime end and continues trans translating, transcribing here to make this very small uh, mRNA. And then in some cases, skips the first TRS, then goes to the second one, and then um, jump, jumps again to the five prime end of the genome, generating all these mRNAs with the same five prime leader sequence on them. They're then transcribed back by the same polymerase into um, the subgenomic uh, plus strand RNAs. So it's a pretty interesting and complicated um, setup for transcription. And one of the things we learned from this is just this is, can be applied to detection of coronavirus RNA by these RT-QPCR assays, these diagno diagnostic assays. Um, there's something really to think about here, I think, because here's a very old gel from 1983 showing the mRNAs um, of mass hepatitis virus. Uh, the, the smallest to the largest, there's always a larger no amount of the smaller RNAs and um, going towards the larger ones in the genome. And so a lot of these assays amplify a region of the, of the RDRP or the replicase gene um, shown here. So they would amplify only the, the full length uh, genome, whereas other assays um, amplify in the nucleocapsid gene. And this would amplify every one of these subgenomic mRNAs as well as genome. So you could really use this two amplifications to, to ask whether you're actually detecting replicating virus or only genome. And in fact, if you're replicating, you should see a much higher molar amount when you replicate N, um, N gene versus um, replicase. So just something uh, I think interesting to think about in all these diagnostic tests where I'm not really sure if we're looking for genome or, or mRNAs or both. Okay, so a little bit about translation of coronavirus proteins. So here's the full length, here are all the mRNAs. And in general, each one's translated from its five prime end into one protein. In some cases, there are two overlapping ORFs shown here, but generally there's only one. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. But the, but the genome is, is translated into two very large polyproteins, PP1A, PP1A1B. And um, this is then proteolized, uh, cleaved, uh, processed into 16 replicase or non-structural proteins. And this occurs by a really interesting process that there's a frame shift um, sequence at the end of, what, of ORF1A or at the end of where uh, PP1A is translated. So during translation, the ribosomes uh, copy down or proceed down or the open reading from 1A, um, translating into PP1A, this long polyprotein, but at some frequency when they meet this uh, frame shift sequence, which is really a pseudonaut, a structure in the RNA, um, the ribosomes slip back one, um, one frame and translate all the way through to, to make PP1, to, 
to synthesize PP1A, 1B, and you get about 20% um, of the time it, it um, reads through to make this longer polyprotein. Um, and, and so it uh, really needs a lot of different enzymes to do this, all this complicated transcription, um, transcription system. And, and those enzymes are, are um, encoded in PP1A and 1AB. 1AB. And I'm going to talk about those a little bit here. So um, here's the PP1A, PP1, PP1A, this would be PP1B, the whole thing, um, the non-structural proteins encoded in these open reading frames. So uh, NSP3 encodes a pathane-like protease that carries out these two cleavages as the protein is being translated. And the 3C-like protease, or the main protease, carries out the rest of these um, cleavages. And then the RDRP, of course, is translated, is, is translated from ORF1B. So this is actually made at a lower level than the two proteases, which I think is, is generally true for most viruses. They synthesize sort of lower amounts of the RDRP than some of the other non-structural proteins. So we have, um, and, and, and this is obviously, this is the um, target of remdesivir that we've all heard about. And these are two protease inhibitors that have been tried on the 3C-like protease, but I don't think they've worked very well. So just in summary, the, we have proteases that process the replicase proteins and an RDRP that replicates genome and transcribes RNA. But all these other ORFs um, encode a, a whole bunch of other really interesting activities, many of which are directed against uh, the host cell uh, responses. So we have some of these like primase activator and helicase are really all parts of the replication complex, but um, there are three uh, enzymes that are involved in capping, NSP16, the NTPase of NSP13, and um, an mRNA capping enzyme in NSP14 are all uh, responsible for capping the um, mRNA, which protects it from detection from the host cell um, innate responses. There's also this uh, endo-U, which I'll talk about a little bit later in, with data, um, that, that uh, reduces the amount of double-stranded RNA accumulation and, again, shields the virus infection from the host. And, the, and, and XON is a proofreading enzyme that uh, is really unique to coronaviruses among RNA viruses, I believe. Um, and it's believed that, that this virus needs an RNA a proofreading enzyme because it has such a long genome that accumulation of um, mutations uh, would be too detrimental and attenuate the virus. And we know that mutations in NSP, NSP14 are very attenuating. Then there are also NSP1 and NSP3 that encode even more host antagonist activities including a deubiquitinase um, and a macro domain. So in summary, these enzymes promote synthesis and stability of viral RNAs, capping of five prime ends, and protection from host cell sensors and interferon response. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. But just um, before that, just to show you how, so all of these proteins are highly conserved among all coronaviruses. And just here's one example of how this works, that, uh, how this might be work for antivirals. So this is um, the helicase or the NSP13 of SARS, the original SARS of MERS and MHV1. I mean, MHV, sorry. Um, th this is one inhibitor that fits into the same binding pocket of all three of these uh, uh, helicases. And it also is able to um, reduce or inhibit replication of SARS, MERS, and MHV. This is plotting titer of virus as a function of increasing amounts of inhibitor. So, um, so this is just one example of how one, uh, one drug um, can in, would be really effective against probably many, if not all, coronaviruses. And just in summary of this first part, so there, there are many conserved features of coronaviruses, the subgenomic mRNAs, the non-continuous RNA synthesis, ORF1A, 1B frame shifting, and all of these are kind of open to, um, to antiviral uh, uh, strategies. We have uh, the conserved proteases, the RNA-dependent um, RNA polymerase and modifying enzymes, and the further host antagonist activities. So I'm going to switch gears here and start to talk about data from my lab. Um, so coronaviruses antagonize double-strand RNA-induced antiviral pathways. Um, so first, this is some really old data from my lab. First, just to show that coronaviruses are adept at evading and antagonizing innate immune responses. And this is um, looking at um, the livers of infected, of MHV infected mice. And we can see that um, compared to here's Sendai virus, and this is a log scale, there's very little induction of interferon beta mRNA 
by this is a bunch of different strains of MHV. And we see the same thing here when we look at um, uh, interferon beta protein by ELISA, there's barely any induction compared to Sendai, which in, induces many logs uh, higher. And this just shows that the viruses all replicate um, by RT-PCR in the liver. So, and then uh, fast forward many years later, like 10 years later at least, and this is MERS coronavirus um, in A549 cells. Uh, and we look by RT-PCR, we see that there's very little induction of interferon lambda or beta. This is a linear scale, so tenfold, fivefold. Whereas when we look at um, either Sendai or Synbis virus, they're inducing like 10 to the fourth or 10 to the fifth log uh, fold uh, of both of these interferons, as well as this interferon stimulated genes. So just as, just as background to show how well this virus shuts down this response, these viruses. So I want to review the double-strand activated um, antiviral pathways. So all, vi all RNA viruses and DNA viruses as well often synthesize double-stranded RNA. It's part of the RNA virus replication patterns. And these are um, sensed by several uh, sensors in the host cell. Uh, coronaviruses are sensed by N MDA5 and not RIG-I. Um, and then that signals through MAVs to produce type 1 and type 3 interferons, that signal through stat um, transcription factors to activate antiviral ISGs uh, that prevent virus replication and spread. But there are two other pathways that our lab's been really interested in that really get activated in parallel to uh, interferon. Um, so OASs, oligodenylate synthetases, are sensed by double-stranded RNA to synthesize 2,5A, which is a small 2 prime, 5 prime oligoadenylate that catalyzes activation of RNA cell. It get, catalyzes dimerization and activation to, to, um, to cleave single-stranded RNA, both viral and host. Um, and that leads to, again, viral restriction, but also uh, reduces protein synthesis and um, increases apoptosis and inflammation. Um, and a third, cat a third pathway is the PKR pathway that's activated also when sensing double-stranded RNA. It autophosphorylates and then PPKR phosphorylates EIF2-alpha, a protein synthesis um, initiation factor, which is leading again to protein synthesis um, reduction and apoptosis. Um, and both of these pathways are also uh, superinduced by interferons because OASs and PKRs are interferon-stimulated genes. Um, so, uh, and it's important also to note that these pathways can also be induced um, independently of interferon. So while many viruses shut down interferon pathways, uh, some viruses have specific inhibitors of this pathway, which is something that um, we've been interested in, in for quite a while now. And the first um, protein I want to talk about is the um, is an inhibitor of, um, of this pathway. It's a phosphodiesterase, an enzyme that cleaves 2,5A, really completely shutting down the RNA cell activation pathway. And those proteins are encoded, um, they're, they're members of the 2H phosphoesterase superfamily with um, HXSTX motifs, catalytic motifs. And these are present in the lineage A beta coronaviruses, MHV and OC43 as a human virus shown here. It's encoded in, in ORF2A. Um, the lineage C, the, Mer the MERS-like viruses and bat viruses um, encode the same activity in NS4B. And um, the Toro viruses that are related, uh, NIDO viruses, also encode um, phosphodiesterases. And interestingly, they're encoded in different parts of the genome. Um, and the, the lineage B viruses, the SARS-like viruses, most notably don't encode this um, kind of enzyme. Um, here, here again is the phosphodiesterase. It has two catalytic histidines. We knew that, um, that NS2 was a 30 kilodalton protein uh, expressed in the cytoplasm. It was not essential for replication in fibroblasts nor, in, nor for um, pathogenesis in the central nervous system, one of the uh, target organs of MHV. And so it was very puzzling what this virus was, what this uh, protein was doing. We knew that it was potentially an enzyme. Um, so we got uh, wild type and mutant strains originally from Stuart Sedell and then reproduced them in our own lab. Um, and he gave them to us because he wanted us to look at them um, in, in more in, in vivo or more animal-like situation. So we, we first um, tried to replicate a wild type and mutant virus in bone marrow derived macrophages from mice. And we saw a pretty stark difference that while the wild type virus replicates the six or seven logs, platforming unit logs of 
of uh, replication, the mutant virus was essentially dead in these macrophages. However, when we uh, thought to try to replicate them in the absence of RNA cell, these are macrophages from RNA cell knockout mice, we immediately saw that, um, that the mutant virus could recover completely its replication. So this put us onto the idea that, um, that NS2 was uh, inhibiting this pathway and we wanted to know where. So, that, so we looked here, this is all in collaboration with Bob Silverman, um, his lab uses this FRET assay to quantify 2,5A, and we found that while wild-type virus induced very little 2,5A during replication, the, mutant, the NS2 mutant virus uh, promoted uh, accumulation of quite a lot of, of uh, 2,5A. And we also use an RNA integrity assay on a chip, and a, a so-called chip, chip assay on a bioanalyzer, um, and that's shown here. So the bioanalyzer generates a kind of pseudo gel. And we can see that um, while the wild type virus, uh, in the wild type virus, uh, uh, ribosomal RNA is largely uh, intact, 28 and 18S, but the mutant virus infected cells show this degraded ribosomal RNA. So this is the, the, the sort of main assay that we use for activation of RNA cell to show that ribosomal RNA is degraded once this um, enzyme is activated. So we did the same kind of experiment looking in the mouse, um, and this is our liver model where we infect mice intrahepatically and my virus replicates over the first five to seven days of infection. It's then cleared by the, primarily by CD8 T cells. And um, we looked at replication of wild type and mutant virus in, in liver, uh, in liver homogenates, and while wild type virus replicates very efficiently up to 10 to the seven logs a PFU uh, per gram of tissue, the mutant virus is barely detectable at all in the livers, whereas in the RNA cell knockout mice, the mutant virus recovers um, replication and replicates to similar levels to wild type. And this was also reflected when we stain tissue sections for viral antigen. The wild type virus produces quite a lot of antigen in the liver of both wild type or mutant mice, whereas the mutant virus replicates or shows antigen only in the knockout mice. And the same when we stain with H&E for pathology or for um, really disruption of the liver. And you can see here that uh, the wild type virus replicates in both wild type and mutant mice, whereas the mutant virus replicates and causes pathology and inflammation only in the mutant mice. So just in summary of this part, Double-strand RNA is, is sensed by OAS to synthesize 2,5A. Um, these 2'5'-phosphodiesterases, like NS2, for example, completely shut down. They cleave 2,5A, preventing um, activation of RNA cell and uh, virus replication and pathogen pathogenesis proceeds. And I just want to indicate here that we've also taken uh, the NS2 from OC43, which is the human virus, and also, there's the, I didn't mention before, but the only other virus group that encodes these kind of phosphodiesterases is rotaviruses, which are completely unrelated. We've taken the rotavirus uh, PDE and also a host PDE and, and expressed them within the, within the MHV backbone in the presence of an NST mutation. And all of these PDEs function in the same way that they can um, antagonize RNA cell and rescue replication of an NS2 mutant uh, and mouse hepatitis virus. So um, I want to talk now a little bit about um, MHV endou or NSP15 also antagonizes mm -hmm. RNA cell. So here we got mu a mutant of um, in the N endou NSP15 um, H227A. We got this mutant from Volker Teal's lab, and um, with with in a collaboration with Volker, we showed that. Uh, again, sort of similar to NS2, that the wild type virus replicates well, the mutant virus really poorly in wild type um, back macrophage, uh, bone marrow derived macrophages from mice. Um, but this is a little bit different from NS2, and what uh, Volker's lab and Susan Baker's lab showed was that uh, the endo2 mutant actually produces a lot more double stranded RNA, which leads to activation of these pathways. Um, so we did an experiment here where we labeled cells for both um, single, for both double-stranded RNA using a J2 antibody in the green, and also single-stranded RNA, which is a fish uh, sort of in situ hybridization for single-stranded RNA. And you can see that there's a lot more single-stranded RNA synthesized by these endomu mutant, um, as well as more double-stranded RNA. 
And then in a collaboration with uh, David Barton and Volker Thiel that's um, currently being revised for publication, we found that um, this endou actually cleaves the three prime end of genome RNA. So it kind of sacrifices its own genome just apparently to prevent the accumulation of double-stranded RNA and, um, and activation of these pathways. And we can see here too that this, um, that, that this mutant does indeed activate RNA cell. Um, but it doesn't recover replication in the absence of RNA cell, as, as we saw with the NS2 mutant. Um, but in macrophages derived from double knockout mice, PKR and, and RNA cell, um, the mutant does recover replication. So that kind of makes sense because the endou is acting at the level of double strand RNA accumulation and would allow replication or activation of both of these pathways. So just to summarize, this case, again, double strand RNA is sensed by OAS, um, but endou is going to reduce the amount of double stranded RNA and, and reduce this pathway activation. And then again, at the 2,5A step, the 2 prime 5 prime phosphodiesterase also inhibits this pathway, leading again to viral pathogenesis. So it's really remarkable to me that, um, that, that in the MHV system, both of these enzymes are required to prevent activation of RNA cell. So e if either one of them is, um, is mutated, the, the pathway proceeds. So this, for this virus, this pathway in the liver is, is really important for pathogenesis. Um, so, I want to, so I want to talk now a little bit about, the, about MERS. So MERS encodes NS4A and NS4B, these small um, uh, accessory proteins. NS4A is a double-stranded RNA binding protein, kind of like flu, maybe like flu NS2. And NS4B encodes a phosphodiesterase, but it's different from the, all the other phosphodiesterases we worked with in that it has a nuclear localization signal. And because of that, and because we, kn we knew from previous experiments that RNA cell um, uh, antagonism really had to occur in the cytoplasm, we wondered whether this protein actually worked as an antagonist. So um, we, oh, I didn't show that. Okay, I'm not showing that data, but we did show that in the MHV system that that uh, NS4B is indeed an RNA cell antagonist. Then with, with Ralph Barrick's lab, we made mutants in the NS4B and NS, we deleted NS4B or NS4A and B uh, from the MERS coronavirus genome. And what we found was that mutation of the um, catalytic residue of the catalytic activity in the NS4B does indeed lead to activation of, of RNA cell. It's not as robust as we saw in the mouse system, but it is there. Um, uh, mutation of the nuclear localization signal had no effect on the enzymatic activity. And if we knocked out NS4A alone, we really saw no activation of RNA cell but knocking out NS4A and 4B did indeed activate, shown here. Um, and when we looked at whether PKR were activated, we can see here using a control of Synbis virus, which activates this pathway really robustly, P PKR and PEIF2 alpha, we saw that wild-type MERS failed to activate um, the pathway, but MERS uh, delta NS4A does cause some activation or phosphorylation of PKR. And again, um, we looked at activation or induction of interferons and, and interferon simulated genes um, by these four NS4A, 4B mutant and wild type NS MERS. And we found that very, very low amounts of interferons were induced by MERS, as I showed earlier, and slightly higher amounts by the mutants. Um, and the same thing for the interferon simulated genes. So, but still very low amounts, again, compared to Synbis virus, which is inducing to 10 to the four to 10 to the five. So with this background, uh, just to summarize this, we found so far that, um, that NS2 can, and NS4B can um, antagonize this RNA cell at this level. NDOU, NS4A can, can um, tamp down each of these pathways, but not very robustly. And uh, endou also prevents activation of these pathways by, uh, by reducing the amount of double-stranded RNA. We're now making a double mutant of endou and 4A, which we presume will really have much more of an effect on shutting down uh, all of these pathways. So now we've turned uh, the last part of the talk, the last few slides is going to be on our most recent data on SARS-CoV-2. So um, here are, here are the, the three different lineages of beta coronaviruses. Um, they're very different, as I said, in the accessory proteins. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is clearly like SARS. And uh, the, the only really proteins that have been 
suggested to be interferon antagonist is this ORF3B protein and ORF6, which is probably the most well characterized in that it interferes with nuclear translocation of STAT1, at least in SARS1 it did. We don't know about SARS2. So what we did, we initially made it, um, we, we produced these A549 cells expressing ACE2. These are immune competent cells and the reason we use them is they're both immune competent and they're also really amenable to knockouts by um, using uh, CRISPR techniques. So here's infection with SARS and see the huge syncytia. So this is all due to cell to cell fusion uh, by the spike protein on the surface of infected cells. So these cells are infected quite well. And, and have this quite active fusion. They also replicate virus quite well. This is just two different clones of these cells. They replicate to pretty much almost the same level as Vero cells, which are usually the cells that SARS is, is, is grown in. Um, so SARS-CoV-2, not surprisingly, induces very low levels of interferons. So here's Synvis virus again, and here's SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, at 24 and 48 hours post-infection, very low amounts of induction of interferon and OAS2, but we were very surprised to find that it does indeed activate um, RNA cell, which is different, again, from MERS or from MHV shown here. And I don't think anybody ever looked at SARS-1 uh, for activation of this pathway. Um, okay, so here we then looked in another cell type. This is a CalU3 cells, another immune competent respiratory tract derived cell. Um, and we compared, here we could compare SARS and MERS and the MERS 4AB mutant. And we found um, that, again, there's very low levels of induction, although much higher than we saw in the A549 cells. Um, and it does look like uh, SARS here is able to induce more interferon than MERS, and certainly more interferon stimulated genes, at least for OAS2. And we saw this with a couple other genes I'm not showing here. And you can see here is replication. SARS replicates much less well. Than, the two, than MERS or the MERS mutant. And we did see here when we looked, this is um, copies of genome replicated. And this is actually uh, platforming units pr uh, produced by the virus, by, the, by these cells. And we can see that again, SARS grows, replicates less well than MERS. And the MERS mutant is somewhat um, attenuated in these cells. It's not attenuated in Vero cells. And that's probably due to the activation of these pathways uh, by MERS mutant. So just um, the last thing we did was we also looked at RNA cell activation um, in these CalU3 cells, and we found that, yes, SARS-CoV-2 again activates, as does MERS, um, Delta, the 4AB mutant. So again, SARS-2 is behaving more like the MERS mutant that lacks these two um, antagonists. And we also found that uh, SARS-2 activates PKR, phosphorylates PKR, like the MERS mutant, unlike the MERS wild type. And also, um, it, it promoted phosphorylation of, of SAT, which was not true for MERS, and that may correlate with the induction of more interferon-stimulated genes um, as, as SAT is activated to, um, to upregulate interferon-stimulated gene activity. So in summary of this part, coronaviruses encode multiple interferon antagonists in conserved non-structural proteins and in lineage-specific accessory proteins. Um, in the MHV system, both NS2 and endo-U are required to prevent activation of OAS RNA cell, and expression of both proteins is required for replication and pathogenesis in the liver. But I didn't show this, but in the brain, it's a completely different story that RNA cell is not activated in the brain, probably because OAS is very poorly expressed. Um, and this is a really interesting topic, I think, which I didn't have time to go into, but this is a really organ-specific uh, effect or cell type specific as well. Um, MERS coronavirus expresses two accessory proteins that when deleted results in weak, weak activation of all three pathways. Um, similarly, an activation of endo-U, I didn't show this either, has little effect on interferon synthesis and PKR. And we believe that probably the combination of both would really, of deleting both would activate these pathways. And finally, SARS-CoV-2, like MERS, weakly induces interferon. However, our, this recent data suggests that it activates RNA cell, induces phosphorylation of PKR and STAT, suggesting it's not as adept as MERS or MHV in shutting down um, these double-stranded RNA-induced pathways. And I just want to acknowledge my lab um, that it's, it's so nice to see us all together because we can't really work that closely together these days. Um, and the people that are bolded here are um, the, the uh, people that have been working with, with the new virus 
um, in the BSL-3. The rest of the lab working on other aspects of, of MHV and MERS. Um, and these are our collaborators. Uh, Bob Silverman, we've worked with him for years very closely on all the RNA cell work um, with Ralph on the mutants, with Volker on the NDOU work, and uh, with David Barton as well. Um, and this is our funding. Uh, so I will stop here and I will, un I will stop sharing. Okay. Wow, Susan. Okay. It, you, I hope that wasn't too much. It's 248. Um, yeah. Okay. We're, we're a hardened audience. We can take a lot of data. Okay. Um, um, so first up, we've got uh, two questions from, I believe, this is Eva Nogales, the uh, Hughes investigator, cryo EM. Um, I'm going to reuse it, Titan at UC Berkeley. <laughs> so, um, Ava, uh, can you please uh, raise your hand? Okay, and can you uh, unmute yourself and ask away? Yes, thank you so much. I love your presentation. I'm really, really thankful that you, you did this for us. So I have a couple of questions. One has to do with the small molecule that you showed bound yeah, to the- I see your question, yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, is this not potent enough? Is, is, is it a good idea, but it has to be improved? Okay, so, so this was done with my collaborator, Stefan Sarfiano, said at the time it was, it was a compound. It was never, you know, when, I don't know if he, I don't think he's done anything more with it either. And, and you know, it was, it's a compound, it's not a drug. So okay. I don't, can't tell you why that wasn't pushed forward. Mm -hmm. but I think um, there, are a lot, there are probably a lot of compounds that will work, you know, at that level, at the, you know, tissue culture level. We never even put it into mice. I think the attractive thing about something that will, um, you know, be effective against many coronaviruses is that we are worried that, you know, the, the COVID-2 is not the last one. So. No. No. Uh, I think it's, it's, it would be very good to have something that works. And, and then other people have asked me, would it work against the common cold? And it might, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we had one. So the other thing, and sorry, this may be just my ignorance. I get very confused with interferon response in early versus late infection. So somehow something is happening during the course of the infection. And yeah. there, there is a good and a bad interferon response. And... It should have been higher at the beginning, but it's not, and it's high at the end, and it's causing death. So what is so, going on there? So I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it is that the observation is like Stanley Perlman probably has the best illustration of that in a paper where he shows that in SARS infection of, of mice, that um, it sort of mirrors what happens. There's really no interferon early, and then late, it's 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 not good. And he shows that he treats the mice early with interferon. It actually, it saves them. <laughs> So it really illustrates that point. And I don't know if it's that maybe, I really don't know. I guess, I mean, the idea is if you get rid of the virus early, then you, you don't lead to that really rampant path, pathology. But I, I, I don't know if I can put into words why, why later it does that or, or why there's that switch, and except to say that maybe the virus kills cells, the cells die, and then there's so much double-stranded RNA that it just goes, that's possible. There's so much stuff to induce it that, because, because one thing we've observed is trying to isolate virus from patient samples, that, that that's an early event. And then after a certain stage, you don't find much virus and then you get all the destruction and all the cytokine storms. So maybe once the virus itself is gone, it can no longer prevent the induction of the pathways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, this is, this is a lot of hand waving because I think nobody really knows. Thanks. All right, Eva, you got any more? Are you done? I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, please lower your hand. And uh, next up, we have our own uh, local uh, virus expert, Kim Rotola, with some questions. So, Kim, oh, there's her hand. I see his question or her question. I don't know if it's a his or a her. It her. Her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's always great to hear real virology talk. Um, so my I question appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, is kind of about the anisotropic yeah. nature of this virus and how it's it's multimodal, even it could be route of infection. It could, you know, we see such differences within an infected in uh, uh, different parts of the population. Uh, can you speak to how much 
it, it doesn't, is there really this much difference in people's interferon um, pathways or, because it, it doesn't seem like the virus is that different that, it, that it's in infecting people unless it's through different routes. Well, the virus, um, the virus itself is pretty similar everywhere, I think. Yeah. The changes that we've observed are not, in my view, are not important in terms of pathogenesis. Um, and, well, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Finish. Yeah, it's okay. Do you feel like it's the mode of transmission of the virus, like in, the, in terms of which cells are infected first might uh, steer the immune response in a different way if you have different interferon responses in different cell types or... Um, yeah. It, yeah. I, th I think a lot of it, I, I would guess a lot has to do with the dose. Like if you get a small dose, you can, maybe you, you can handle it better and it doesn't get down into the lung. That's one of my hypotheses that... and. Um, I mean, I guess that's true. We see very different immune responses in different cell types, but I'm not sure what's, but I, usually I would think the root of infection is going to be through the nose. And I don't know how many different cell types with different immune responses are, are, are found in the nose. I do know that the one thing we did that I think is kind of very preliminary, very interesting though, infecting um, nasal epithelium from humans that, first of all, we saw very different amounts of replication from different people's, uh, different individuals. So that's sort of interesting. And we also saw that the time course of replication seems longer for SARS-2 than it did for MERS, you know, in the same patients. Mm -hmm. So I think it may, maybe a lot of it has to do with that initial interaction in the nasal, in the nose. And can you speak to a little bit how the interferon response might be different in younger population versus older? And if, if that, you know, how that's playing into this? Okay, that I really don't, I really don't know. I mean, I, I hate saying, I keep saying I don't know, but I don't want to say something I don't know. But I really, I don't know. I mean, I think again, why young people get, don't get as sick as old people is also a lot of hand waving. I, I, I don't know. I mean, in general, older people have a less good immune response than younger people, but I'm not sure at the interferon level if that's true. Or if they would get a more or less robust um, cytokine storm, so to speak. So I think we just don't know. There's so many things we don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, we got anything else, Kim? Nope, I'm good. Okay, thank you. All right, Susan, I got some questions here. Okay. So, um, of the three major pathways, so in our speakers so far, we've heard um, a fair bit about interferon response. We've heard a bit about um, apoptotic and inflammasome mediated responses. We've heard nothing about uh, PKR, uh, protein kinase R. And so this came as a bit of, of a surprise to me that I was completely ignorant about one of the major pathways so I was looking on the Wikipedia page for PKR uh, when you were talking. Um, seems that lots of viruses produce robust uh, PKR inhibition, uh, HIV, Hep C, flu, herpes simplex, et cetera, et cetera. There was nothing on the Wikipedia page about any coronavirus. Um, uh, so, but you've shown that SARS-2 is indeed um, inhibiting PKR. No, it's activating it. Oh, sorry. So, a little bit. That's, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. activating it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, why, why have we not heard anything about uh, PKR yet? Okay, and, you haven't heard about RNA cell either, right? Except for our work. Um, it, one, I, I think Ben mentioned RNA cell. Okay. So we, I mean, so I think it's because, I don't know, I can't tell you why, except that Bob Silverman and I are probably the only people that really study RNA cell with viruses. I mean, there, there are a few others, but, but we've spent a lot of time on that pathway in particular. And PKR comes, I mean, for us even, that's a separate, a side thing. It's like, it's a, there are two parallel pathways. And I think part of the issue is that a lot of people assume that PKR and RNA cell are downstream pathways dependent on interferon because... PKR and OAS are interferon stimulated genes, as I said. But we find so clearly, we take maths, I didn't show this, but we have data now where we made maths knockouts and RNA cell is completely activated in the, in the presence of, uh, in the absence of maths. So mm -hmm. people have ignored those pathways. And, and I think at least the mouse virus, I'm glad we did that first because it really shows you that 
in that virus, there are two proteins that need to shut down that pathway uh, for the virus to even survive. And in the, in, um, in Volker Thiel's paper with endo U, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't recover in MADS knockout cells. It recovers in PKR RNA cell knockout cells. So it's those pathways are really can really be restrictive. And these viruses, I don't know why, I can't tell you why people have ignored them. People have talked about PKR in terms of apoptosis, mm -hmm. protein synthesis inhibition, but, and, and actually what, but what's also curious is, I don't know if you noticed this, but um, I had Sendai and, and, and um, Synbis often as controls. They activate these pathways really robustly, even though they replicate very well. So every virus is tuned in a different way. And, and also this is really, really cell type specific. Yes. So like, as I said, RNA cell is activated only in, in, um, in myeloid cells, endothelial cells, not in neurons, not in hepatocytes, not, so, it's, it's really, so that's why we want to make, we have knockout, we're going to have um, like Lysem, Cree, RNA cell knockout mice. I want to know if you knock out that pathway only in macrophages, is that sufficient to allow a mutant to grow? Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little off topic here, but I think it's because, because people didn't think those pathways are that important and just sort of subservient to interferon and it's not true. Okay. So the, the obvious follow-up then is, you know, it, at this point in time, I would say that um, interferon one and three, you know, early treatment with those two, it's probably the most promising therapeutic intervention we have for early cases. Do, do you think that there's going to be something similar for the other two pathways that we might be able to use? I noticed that there, uh, I, I found a paper from the mid 90s about um, uh, 25A analogs that are more drug-like yeah. and would activate RNA cell. D do you think maybe that those would be, um, that we could drug those and turn on that pathway as a backup? Possibly, possibly. Um, whether, whether if you treated with interferon, would you shut down? It depends if those pathways aren't that well activated, like, oh, it just all depends on OAS level. So if they're not, if OAS was not that high in the, in the relevant cell types, then maybe you, if you knock down interferon, that would be enough to, to in turn knock down RNA cell. But it might be, it depends. If RNA cell is an important primary pathway like that, yeah, it would be helpful. But I think interferons are, they're talked about. I think there are clinical trials going on for interferons. Oh, 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 right. No, I mean, yeah. you're right. Everyone's talking about interferons. And that, 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 yeah. So, yeah, that's got. So does it work? Do we know? I mean, it works in mice. It works. It works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. T t that's what I mean. Like at this point in time, I mean, I think that early stage. That's where ICU docs are having the best luck. But do we hear that? Do we hear people? I, I guess I'm behind the times. People actually getting treated that way other than trials? Absolutely. And that it is very efficacious. Oh, good. Yeah. You know, for late stage, um, you know, it's more the, you know, interleukin-6 uh, pathways to, to block the, the, as you said, the post-virus <laughs> inflammatory response. But, but no, I, I mean, I, I think interferon, it, it could really be, you know, one of the actual game changers. It seems so simple in a way you know yeah. people trying all these drugs maybe yeah yeah no it's a bit embarrassing that we're we're five months into this before you know before i started seeing reports from icu front lines that this was really working but, but i also think we've done this incredibly fast everything that's happened has been so fast yes i mean sars one was fast too people went pretty crazy and and it, yeah. you know then it was gone but yeah there was a lot of mobilization at that time. Yeah, but so my question for you is, I mean, so there, there are maybe these two 5A analogs that we could drug up. Um, was there anything obvious for uh, PKR that you think? Is there, a, is there an obvious druggable mechanism there? There, there might be, I, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. Probably, would it, nah, I don't know. That I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. So next line of questioning. Um, 
Yeah, I want to circle back to um, viral mutations that okay. do or don't make a difference. Okay. Um, I'm, I largely agree with you. I do think that um, D, I'm going to get the number. D614G. Yeah, I mean, so that that is showing, I mean, of course, in cell culture, it makes a huge difference. But even in humans, I mean, it is making a very uh, slight but significant difference in in CT. So. I, have, I have one bone to pick about, oh, in CT, okay. I have one bone to pick about that. Please. Nobody's made the virus with that one mutation in it. So, I mean, except in like pseudotypes and stuff like that. Nobody has taken a virus that has only that mutation relative to wild type, right? So you take it out of patients. There are other mutations that are, that are present. Yeah. So I want to know, I mean, maybe I'm being bone picking here, but I, I really want to show that that mutation itself has some particular effect. I'm thinking on, on entry and on pathogenesis. Yeah. I, I mean, I think in cell culture, that's, single mutation has definitely been shown to make a big... No, in entry. It's shown in pseudotypes. It's never been shown in a virus that, I, that I've seen. Mm -hmm. If you ask people, nobody's made the... I mean, <laughs> it's hard to make viruses. It's hard to make recombinant viruses, but somebody will do that, I'm sure. And, and then we'll know. I mean, the pseudotypes are a good surrogate, but they're not perfect. So I would want to see it. What happens in real virus and what happens when you take a virus with that one mutation in, in, a, in a model? What does it do to pathogenesis? Yeah. I think. But yeah, okay. So my, my, my question was not about that mutation. Okay. It was um, about the uh, cleavage sites. So, you know, what was it about like, about around April, the, you started seeing this thread of uh, conspiracy theories saying that because there was this furin cleavage site, that this was definitely lab engineered, et cetera, et cetera. That, but, you know, as you showed, the, the, the furin site is a bit of a red herring. Um, and, I mean, obviously it was naturally evolved. This, we're not even talking about that. My question for you is, um, so you showed that you need cleavage at the S1, S2 boundary, and then a second cleavage right at the beginning of S2. My question is, has any... Um, naturally evolved coronavirus figured out how to make condense that into a single cleavage event that fully no. released? No, no. no. I, I'm trying to think if you'd even want it to. I mean, if it would help. So, uh, no, I don't think you'd want to do that because if you cleaved S1, S2 intracellularly, you don't want to activate the fusion peptide till you're re ready to go. Right? Okay. So when you attach to the surface you, and you mm. cleave the second site, you're already in the right place. So yeah, you probably... Okay. So the, okay. But one thing that is interesting, that the JHM strain of, of, A15, of um, MHV has a really complete cleavage and it's got a very unstable S1, S2 association so that mm. it, can, it can actually trigger fusion without its receptor. It's, it's very strange, yeah. So if you take cells infected with that particular strain and then overlay them, say, with BHK cells or cells that don't have a receptor, it'll cause fusion. It's that one strain. Um, and it's, it's, I've thought about that. And someone did an experiment, and they showed that SARS-2 doesn't do that, just for what it's worth. Huh. But have people worked out the, the, the molecular um, mechanism of how it's able to do that? Well, the, the mechanism, not specifically, except that once it loses S1 and S2 is, exp and, and the, then it's cleaved and the S2, the fusion peptide is exposed, it's just in a juxtaposed membrane can, can do it. Huh. So, and so this is why I th the, my other thing about the D614G is that people say that it makes the S1, S2 association more stable, which is the opposite of what this JHM does. Mm. And so JHM, being unstable spreads really quickly. I guess that's why I'm a little resistant to the that mutation because yeah. it seems counterintuitive to me, but it could, mm -hmm. I'm sure it could be correct. 
I mean, the mechanism that, that I've seen proposed is a slight increase in titer um, through poorly understood mechanisms. By, by virus or by pseudotype? By virus. Okay. But again, that virus has other mutations in it. Yeah. I, I don't want to be too crazy about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you had to bet, if you were the virus and you were going to mutate one thing that would actually change the course of your, pan, of your pandemic, what, what would you mutate? You mean to make it get better or worse? Make it get better. You're the virus. Okay. okay. I, oh, you mean to make the virus do better? That's right. That's oh, okay. I think it's doing so well. I don't know what else. Uh, <laughs> no, I can, I can think lots of ways to make it worse, but better. No. Let's and see. Just, we just want to be prepared, you know, so, uh, you know, for vaccines, we're trying to prepare oh, okay. for antigenic escape, et cetera. Um, what else do we need to be preparing for? Oh, what could happen? Um, what, what, what could happen? What what mutation no. would actually change? I mean, it, could, it could get a better interferon antagonist. It could somehow mm. um, tune up one of the antagonists to work better. It could recombine with another virus, but that's unlikely. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, I think okay. we, we would have seen evidence for that in, in some previous. But we don't have, I mean, nobody here has, this is something I've thought about a lot, whether it can recombine with other coronaviruses or only with, lineage B beta coronaviruses, because I don't think it can recombine with OC43, say, or something like that. Yeah, no, I don't think we've, I don't think we've seen that. Yeah. No, I can't, I mean, I guess it could maybe put more glycosylations on its spike to prevent mm. interaction with antibodies. That's always a possibility. Mm. I, I think, I think a vaccine is going to be good. That's my gut feeling. Oh, absolutely. So, I, yeah, I'm pretty optimistic about that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Sarada, do you have any questions? Um, I'm no, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, this was this was amazing, Susan. Thank you. Forty years of my life. <laughs> Is that all? <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank, oh, thank, it's really nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Please, please continue the fight. <laughs> yeah. You too. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye.